Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. It was a real pleasure uh, to listen to you. And for students who unfortunately missed the summit, what are your impressions? How do you like Warwick? Um, well, this is my second time here. The first time I just came to attend a convocation uh, mm -hmm. to watch uh, a cousin who uh, graduated here from a PhD mm -hmm. uh, with a PhD. And um, I was quite um, impressed by the size of the, uh, of the audience and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and, the, and the quality of the questions. Um, and I also had a chance to look at the brochure and the kind of people that you invited and, and clearly it's one of these um, seminars that's bringing together people who are going to add value to um, economic thought and current thinking. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I would just like to give some flavour to students who unfortunately didn't manage to, to listen to your talk. So as you're an advocate of uh, Muslim banking, could you uh, expand your ideas a bit more and explain us why uh, financial institutions should have uh, implemented, uh, at least to a certain extent, uh, religion uh, in their uh, business? Uh, well, for example, uh, Sharia law? Uh, well, first of all, Islamic banking is really not about religion. It's, um, it's a product. Mm -hmm. um, it's, um, for me, it's part of a whole um, collage of financial inclusion um, instruments. Okay, you've got people who um, do not want to use conventional banking because, uh, for religious reasons, they don't want to take interest, um, and therefore products are. Um, um, you've got innovative products that seem to that, that address their concerns um, and that basically are based on profit sharing. Uh, you've got um, other people who are excluded because they're women. You've got people who are excluded because they are rural, and therefore you get into things like mobile banking, for example, um, um, and microfinance banking that can be reached by um, so for those who can be reached by the large deposit money banks. So, um, in Islamic banking or non-interest banking is just another product um, that aims to reach um, some some of some of the some of those people, um, and I think it's. Um, an industry that's grown, you now have over a trillion dollars worldwide in assets. Uh, you've got um, the products all over, you've got Islamic Bank of Britain uh, here on Adria Road, uh, you have um, Islamic Banking in the United States, you have the French now uh, who want to um, start Islamic Banking in Paris, um, and it's something that's now gone beyond Muslim countries, um, and it's just accepted HSBC has a whole Islamic Banking subsidiary, um, so does Standard Chartered Bank, so does Deutsche Bank. So, um, it's become global. Your numbers uh, in fighting corruption in Nigeria as well as improving economic situation uh, in that country are widely recognized uh, internationally as well as nationally. So w w what would be your prospective goals? I think the, for, for me working in the central bank and having the opportunity to deal with these issues uh, was part of my contribution to clean up the image of the country. Um, corruption is something that's um, endemic in many African countries, uh, but it's something that uh, there is an increasing recognition um, of the dangers that it causes uh, to those economies and why we need to change. Um, and um, the banking system is one good place to, to start, but you've got other industries, you've got, you've got the oil and gas industry, for example, uh, you've got the civil service, and um, it's got to be an ongoing process. Um, but once we do that and improve governance and transparency, we will see the benefits in terms of economic growth. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned oil, uh, and that's definitely a hot topic uh, in, in Nigeria. So let's try to be a bit more specific. Do you think that the, the difference in prices in oil in Nigeria and in the developed world might result in increasing of international investment in Nigeria. Is that one of your goals? Um, no, um, one, of, one of the major problems, of course, um, uh, if, if, I, if, if I get you right, it's got to do with the, the recent fuel subsidy uh, removal debate. Um, what, what the fuel subsidies have done is to distort the market. Um, and made it um, easier for people to import uh, refined petroleum products than to invest in refineries. Um, and what we're pushing for are reforms that will lead to an end in those subsidies but encourage investments into local refining capacity um, so that we actually refine our own crude and export refined petroleum products rather than exporting crude and then turning around and using the foreign exchange to import, uh, 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 to import fuel. Um, the result is that if we don't do that, we keep depleting our reserves, we keep putting our exchange rates under pressure, 
um, and we keep widening the fiscal deficit. So um, investments into that sector will only happen when the subsidies go and people know that they are um, operating in a market that is, that is transparent and that does not depend on government support. However, the current situation in Nigeria is not so good considering that more than 90% of people are very poor uh, and that to a certain extent leads into frustration of people. Uh, and there is also increasing relevance of extremism. Uh, so it, is it maybe possible, uh, what would you say was the probability of new civil war? I don't think there's um, a, a very strong likelihood of a civil war. Um, but I do think that um, in the short to medium term, uh, we need to move very quickly to address the problems of um, social and economic inequality. Um, and if those are not addressed, we continue to lay the foundations for instability. Um, uh, wherever you have um, a high level of unemployment, it's really youth unemployment, um, and um, a very high level of poverty, then there are ground swells of frustration that can be tapped into by all sorts of extremist groups. Now, these could be religious, they could be ethnic, um, they could be a radical left wing, um, but um, you certainly do not want to create a circumstance in which there is ammunition uh, for these ideas. It is one thing to fight the battle of ideas, it's another thing to, um, uh, to realize that um, the, the greatest way to defeat them is to remove that um, the material basis um, uh, for them, and, and that comes with the kind of and poverty alleviation. Yes. And in line with that, how would you comment on the, one of the recent quotes uh, of the Nigerian president, Mr. Uh, Godluck, uh, who commented that the current situation in Nigeria is even worse uh, than it was with civil war, uh, considering the, the influence uh, of, uh, of extremism? Well, I mean, he, I, I suppose from a security perspective, what he was referring to was that you, he's dealing with an enemy that is not very clear. In the case of the civil war, you had one part of the country that wanted to succeed. Uh, it was very clear that um, this was the enemy, or, or, the, or these were the two um, antagonists. The, the, it was a structured battle, the two armies fighting, and they were defeated, and that was it. Um, in the case of um, terrorism, you don't know where it's going to come from. Uh, you, you, you can be living with with someone next door, somebody you could have, somebody in your house um, who is part of a terrorist cell and you don't know. Um, and, and the government has very little um, um, in terms of ability to fish these things out and to anticipate and to know exactly uh, where they which are. They don't move in the, as an army, you don't see them when they plan. Uh, the, the bombings in Kano um, were, were tragic, uh, but I mean, imagine 40 bombs exploding in one city and killing over 300 people in one day. And uh, if you're head of state, you probably would think that is frightening. Um, so, in your opinion, who is standing behind Buka Haram? I is it easy to? Uh, obviously, it's not easy to identify, but in your opinion, I don't um, know. I think these, what the security services believe is that there are a number of issues. There is the um, there is the local um, case of a group of people who hold a certain view and who may have some grievances because of what they see as excessive use of force by the state in the past. Um, but I think there is an increasing suspicion that um, they have um, received wider support from the sub-region, uh, from what is called al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, um, going um, all the way to see Mauritania and Mali. Uh, and um, there is now a need for some transnational cooperation across borders um, and have a regional security framework in the whole of West Africa to make sure that that doesn't happen. Yes. Uh, to finish our uh, short interview in a positive tone, I would just like to uh, ask you, do you think that some positive trends in Nigeria uh, in terms of fighting against corruption and increasing uh, in economic sense might get uh, spillover in other uh, African countries? Yes, I do think so. Just, just as I do believe that things happen in some African countries like Ghana, and like um, Ethiopia, like Botswana, uh, will continue to serve as peer pressure for us in Nigeria to improve. Um, I, I think African countries have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, but Nigeria is 
what, it's 70% of the population of West Africa. It's 60% um, of West African GDP. Um, it's, I mean, one out of every six black people in the world is Nigerian. So certainly, um, uh, an improvement in how things are done in Nigeria will have a major impact on the subregion as a whole. Governor Sanusi, it was a real pleasure Thank to you. talk to you. Thank you very much for coming at Warwick the National Summit 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.